Dear participants, it is my pleasure to open this live Yuma webinar on antimicrobial stewardship from theory to practice. And today we have esteemed speakers that have been working uh, very long in this field. And I'm very, very much looking forward for an exciting and a very educative webinar. And first, I will present you shortly the antimicrobial stewardship program in Yuma. So we are really grateful with this program, with these sponsors. You can see in the bottom line of bottom line of this slide, B. Brown, SCT, Flynn, Health and Polymen. Without their support, this program uh, couldn't be realized. Next one, please. And here you can see our aim. Our aim is to reduce inappropriate use of antibiotics by promoting infection prevention and control, correct diagnostics of infection, and also the use of uh, alternatives to antibiotics in wound management across all healthcare settings. We have a very uh, multidisciplinary expert group. Uh, as you can see, uh, 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 Sebastian Props, the immediate Yuma president from Switzerland, Thomas Bjarnsholt from Denmark, that is going, he's going to present us today. Uh, Elena Conde Montero from Spain, Klaus Kirketab Möller from Denmark, Karen U OC UK, she will be presenting today as well, Paulo Ramos from Portugal, and Eva Sturmer from, from Germany. Uh, please go and read our recently published document on antimicrobial stewardship. Uh, Sebastian Props was the editor of this document, Karen O.C., Thomas Bernsholm, Edgar Beek, Peters also very strongly involved. It was an update of the 2013 Yuma document on antimicrobials and non-healing wounds evidence, including also controversies and suggestions for future research, future clinical studies. And importantly, it included also a one page that was consigned, concise and described antimicrobial stewardship for wound care practitioners. And we can see the one page in the next slide. So you can see the title, a concise approach to treating potentially infected wounds. This is a very practical, helpful tool for daily clinical practice. And uh, it is already available in seven European languages. As you can see, uh, very many languages already published. And we are even working uh, on publishing it on Croatian. And the next one, please. And uh, we are very proud of this Yuma BSEC online course, Antimicrobial Stewardship in Wound Management, uh, that you can join freely. And Karen Osi here, here speaking, is a very strong um, person working on this one. But now it is my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Karen Osi from the University of Huddersfield, and she will give us, shed us light on the wound infection continuum and swapping techniques. Please, Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kirsi, and thank you everybody for joining this session today. I'm going to just do a brief overview of the wound infection continuum that the International Wound Infection Institute published last year and also to talk about wound swabbing techniques as well and this will help for the next presentations as well who will talk about it a little bit more depth. So thank you Kirsty. I'm Karen Uze, Professor of Skin Integrity at the University of Huddersfield and also chair the International Wound Infection Institute. 
the um, Wound Infection Institute's consensus document was only allowed to happen because of the unrestricted grants from the companies you can see in front of you. And it was also supported and published by Wounds International. The document itself is free to download from the Wounds International website or from the IWII website. So please, if you want to know more, just go along and download it free of charge. So for people that maybe don't know, the aim of the IWII is to advance knowledge and skills in the pursuit of prevention, identification and management of wound infection. So everything we do is to talk about wound infection and to help enhance people's knowledge and skills. As well as this, we undertake a range of different research projects and these change from year to year. But the common aim is to improve clinical practice through translation of the research, the evidence and the scientific evidence into clinical practice. So we use what the scientists have been doing and try and enhance patient care by explaining it as well. And you can see here, this is the new updated document that was launched, launched in 2022. Every single part of it has actually been updated. So there's 15 different sections and the tables, if you're aware of the 2016 document, have all been updated. The main thing we looked at was the wound infection continuum and wanted to really develop that to have very much a story for practitioners to look at from being able to identify infection and differentiate it between contamination and infection to have something that staff could pull out of the document or download and maybe put into a pocket so that you can look at it regularly or stick it onto a wall. We've also got a range of definitions there so that people can have a look at and hopefully that will allow equity across the definitions that we use. And we've also looked at all the research and evidence and we've graded the evidence to see if it's good, moderate or of low evidence. So you're able to look at that as well in the document. So it's very much an updated working document. But what we really wanted to look at as well at the beginning was to be able to define wound infection. Because when we ask lots of clinicians what they understand by wound infection, there's some various different definitions that people will utilize. So what we've suggested is that it's the invasion of a wound by proliferating microorganisms to a level that invokes a local spreading or a systemic response. And we know that when we have a wound infection, microorganisms multiply within that wound and we develop a range of different factors that we can help overcome that. And it's important though that we're able to notice when a wound is becoming infected to know when to take appropriate action because clearly prevention is better than cure sometimes. There's also areas when we can't prevent infection, so we need to understand how do we manage that appropriately, especially when we think about antimicrobial stewardship. And Kirsty managed to mention the course earlier, which is really important if people have an interest in this, to have a look at and complete. But antimicrobial stewardship is so important. We have to ensure that we have judicious use of our antimicrobials and antibiotics. Otherwise, in the next 10 years, we're not going to have anything at all to use, if not sooner than that. So within the wound infection continuum, I'm going to spread it over a couple of slides and then show you the full pullout afterwards. But you can see here, this is a really nice, easy to look at continuum that shows you the different signs of infection. So we start with contamination and colonization, which we don't have to worry about using antiseptics, antibiotics for, because there's no delay in the wound healing there. We then go on to local wound infection, where staff are able to look at this and understand those subtle covert signs and the overt classical signs that people know about, such as hypergranulation in the wound, erythema, where you get local warmth, swelling, and you see that excess discharge as well. And patients start saying to you, my wound has got a really strange smell about it, or it feels quite painful. We then have spreading infection and systemic infection. And you can see within this, it's color coded. So as the continuum green shade darkens, the microbial burden increases as well. 
And it's really important that we understand about spreading and systemic infection because this can be so very dangerous for the patient as well. So it's worth having a look at this and understanding those different terminologies and sharing them with others who may not be quite as au fait with them as you are at the moment. The continuum then carries on down, as you can see, and we talk about being alert for those clinical indicators as well, of a potential biofilm. And Thomas is going to talk about biofilm shortly. And we suggest then that you initiate biofilm-based wound care so that where appropriate, you can use that step up, step down approach and perform therapeutic cleansing. And we don't particularly recommend any sort of cleansing solution because it depends where you are in the world as to what you have access to. So please look at local guidelines as well to see what you can have. Remember that prior to taking a wound swab as well, if that's what you're going to do, you must cleanse the wound thoroughly first. So don't be tempted to take a wound swab from that really dirty area of the wound. Make sure it's nice and clean the wound bed and then take your wound swab. Then we talk about debridement and applying a wound dressing. But remember, throughout this, we must have holistic management of the patient. So check the nutrition is good. Is the pain being managed? What type of pain do they have as well? Are they mobile? Are there any comorbidities? So it's not just about looking at the wound, it's looking at the patient holistically. And at the bottom of the continuum, you'll be able to see this, that step down, step up biofilm based wound care that's been taken from Schultz's work. And it's very clear here where you initiate multiple therapies, then you optimize therapy, you de-escalate and throughout you continue to evaluate that wound healing progress. So is it improving or is it deteriorating? Is the patient complaining of excess pain, for example, or do you see an increase in malodor as well? And then think about advanced therapies and continue your therapies until healed, be they advanced or not advanced. But it's really important that these wounds are monitored regularly and evaluated regularly and documented so the next person that comes along and assesses that wound can quite clearly see what you did before they got there and what they need to do. And ask the patient as well, how do they feel about it and document that. So this is the full wound infection continuum management guide. That easily can be pulled out of the paper document of IWII or if you go onto the IWII website, you can download that free of charge as well. So please do use it. Very good for using in practice, but good as well for teaching if people aren't sure about what is an infected wound, what's not an infected wound, what's inflammation and what's infection that people sometimes do get a little confused with. But we also need to be able to diagnose wound infection from not just looking at the wound, but also to look at diagnostic investigations. And you can see here the diagnostic investigations we should be thinking about. So thinking about blood tests, those hematological markers, why we're we doing them, what's the purpose of them. Microbiologists are so talking about wound culture. Is it tissue biopsy or are you going to be doing a wound swab? Do we need any radiological investigations as well? So, for example, does the patient need to go for an MRI or a CT scan or do they just need x-rays? And to use ultrasound, if you think there may be, you need to know about where the abscess is, is there a fluid collection or is there a hematoma present? But again, make sure these are all documented, the rationale for undertaking them and what the results are and keep the patient informed as well. And when we're sampling, we know there's a range of different ways of sampling to see whether or not a wound is infected. Tissue biopsy is the preferred sampling method. This is really good. It provides quantitative and qualitative information and it identifies that organism or organisms that are present in the wound. However, we know that it's rather costly to do this. The person who takes a tissue biopsy must be trained. They must have the knowledge and the skills to be able to undertake this correctly and safely. Otherwise, there is potential for further tissue damage. And generally, particularly in the UK, it's not routinely performed in most clinical settings. So you need to ensure that you're following your local guidance. 
if you're taking tissue biopsy, that you are competent in being able to do this as well. So what we see is that wound swabbing tends to be the thing that's undertaken more often because staff are able to do that and they understand it more. We recommend the Levine technique. So as we said earlier, you're going to clean that wound, debride the wound as well, moisten the wound tip, and then take your wound swab from there as well. What's important as well, which people often forget, is to label the sample so that when it gets to the laboratory, the laboratory assistants there, they know exactly where the wound is, how long the patients have the wound, the depth, any relevant comorbidities, and any antibiotic therapy that's there. Remember that in the laboratory, they haven't seen the patient. They don't have that, that you've seen, you've spoken to the patient, you've seen the wound, you fully understand it. So give them as much information as possible. Also make sure that that sample is sent off in a timely manner. So if you don't have any sort of way to send the sample to the laboratory over a weekend, don't take the swab on a Friday night. Otherwise, it's going to sit on the ward or in the clinical area until Monday morning. So take it on a Monday morning and make sure, again, you've organised that sample delivery in a timely manner. If you're unsure, you may be thinking now, oh, what's the Levine technique? I really haven't heard of this. I'm not sure what to do. There is a lovely YouTube recording of how you undertake a Levine technique and what it means. So the link is here for you. And I'm sure you'll be able to get it after this recording as well. So have a click on that and that will show you quite easily how to undertake a Levine technique. So in conclusion, we've seen that the IWII has a wound infection continuum that shows you the difference from contamination, colonization up to systemic infection. It also shows you how to differentiate between inflammation and infection. It gives you a very nice step-by-step -step guide of what you need to do when cleansing the wound. Think about therapeutic cleansing and debriding before you start thinking about that wound dressing, that we must clean a wound thoroughly prior to wound, taking a wound swab. And if we can take a tissue biopsy, that's really good but also to ensure that we work as a multidisciplinary team so that the laboratory knows exactly what's on that swab, that if you need any different diagnostic interventions, you include that multidisciplinary team. But possibly more importantly, you actually ensure that you keep the patient at the heart of everything we do and they understand everything. Thank you very much for listening and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Karen, for the beautiful presentation. We can see really your expertise that you have been uh, for a long time in the area. And I, I cannot see any questions yet from the QAA, but there is still some, there is time for you to write them. I can see comments in the chat uh, thanking Karen and very good for uh, very good presentation. Uh, I have. Meanwhile, the others are thinking about questions. I have one question that goes uh, perhaps a little bit far from the area, but still as you are an expert, and I would like to hear your opinion on the role of compression therapy in preventing and treating infection. Percy, uh, I think compression therapy is really useful for the lower limb, obviously, for management of edema, et cetera. But I think we have to really go back to basics with infection that staff need to. Staff sometimes get a little bit confused and panic a bit. So they look at a wound and they think, oh, it's red. It must be infected. Whereas they've got to be able to have that confidence to say, well, actually, it's not just because it's red. You've got to look at the patient as a whole. And is, is there any pain there? Is there malodor there? Erythema, et cetera. So once you've been able to identify if it is an infection, and say it's on the lower limb, we talk about compression, then manage that infection, yes, use compression as well. Just using compression on its own won't manage the infection. You need to look at what's caused it and then treat it. But I do think a lot of it is about, it's confidence, Percy, as well. People don't want patients to be unwell or in pain. So you see that redness and you think, oh no, it's infected when mm. it's not. So it's just a matter of, 
understanding and being confident, but telling the patient as well, because they panic as well and say, I want one of those special dressings that manage my wound. So they need to fully understand. Yes, I, I totally agree. And then I think uh, there is a randomized clinical trial that shows that compression therapy can prevent cellulitis even better than, than antibiotic antibiotic preventive treatment. Thank you. But now we have a, a question from the chat. What is the best solution to cleaning? Oh, that's a loaded question, Kirsty. So it depends where you are in the world as well. So do you have running water, for example? Do you have access <laughs> excuse me, to a range of different solutions? So there is no right solution. It depends where you are, what your local policies are, as well as what you can get hold of, but also to look at what does the wound look like as well. So some people use possible water, other people use a range of different solutions. So I don't want to say what's the right solution because there isn't a right solution. It depends what your local guidance suggests. But IWII in their documents as well, I've gone through all the different solutions, said what they are and what they're for as well. So it's worth having a look at that for a reference. Thank you. And uh, another question, why does the wound need to be clean before taking a swap? Uh, I think intuition tells you to take a wound swab from the dirtiest, horriblest place on the wound, but that's only on the top. Remember those bits. So you need to clean it all off, get rid of all that excess exudate, excess gunk, for want of a better phrase, get down to a clean wound bed, and then you can see actually what virulence is there. So otherwise you're going to get a false reading. So please clean it all off first and then take your swab, even though your intuition says to take it from the dirty part. Thank you, Karen. And then the last question, what do you think about MedCo? I think it's Coupe, Coupe? MedCo. Is it I like a Coupe solution? Haven't used it and I don't know anything about it, Kirsty. Yeah. So I'm afraid yeah. I can't answer. Well, we han haven't used it in Finland neither, but uh, just to uh, highlight Karen's point that uh, it is not always, it is not about the solution. Well, you can use several, right, Karen? Yeah, no right or wrong answer. Look at what you have. And then because sometimes you've got the choice of one thing. So it's better to clean it with that one thing than not clean it. Yes. And for the cleaning before taking sample, do you recommend saline solution or only or soap also? Saline's good. Yeah, you can use saline. It's not a problem. Yeah. I agree. Well, thank you, Karen, again. And thank we ha have still time for discussion in the end. So if you have some questions for Karen, we can take them in the end. But now it is uh, uh, the time to welcome our um, uh, Mr. Biofilm, Thomas Barnsholt, from, a professor from University of Copenhagen, and he will tell us wise words about biofilms, myth, myths and reality. Please, Thomas. You are muted. Thomas. Then it could be a very uh, short and uneventful uh, talk by me if I was muted all the time. So, but thank you, Kirsty, for the nice introduction, and also thank you, Karen, for um, for a very uh, thorough introduction to to the field. So, um, what I will do here is to talk about bacteria in wounds, talk about biofilms in wounds, and um, also single cells, and and a little bit about what we know and what we don't know, and what, at least in my opinion, I think we we um, don't need to discuss anymore and what we need to discuss uh, in the future. I'll just see if I can. Um, yeah, so when we talk about biofilms and single cells, we normally discuss the biofilms planktonic bacteria, and we discuss that 
planktonic bacteria, as you see here in the movie, uh, can be easily phagocytosed by white blood cells uh, and other phagocytes. Um, and also, if we use um, antibiotics and antimicrobial agents, um, can easily kill um, planktonic bacteria. Then we we'll talk about biofilms. Are these aggregates, these small fortresses of bacteria, which certainly cannot be either phagocytosed and cannot be eradicated by otherwise susceptible bacteria. Um, and that is um, in, in, in terms also uh, very, very correct. Um, and usually when we talk about biofilms and most um, papers about biofilms and also presentations about biofilms, they include a feature like this. Um, this is a based on a lot of um, experiments that Karen Sauer um, performed on Pseudomonas aeruginosa in flow conditions grown with glucose. And for that, it's a, a perfect model. It states that planktonic bacteria can see the surface first with re reversible attachment. Then there will be irreversible attachment. There will be some maturation and matrix buildup. And then these 3D structures will protrude out of, of the surface. And you can also have uh, dispersion where single cells are released into the media. And, and this is actually, this is by no doubt what goes on in a flow cell of, of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Then when it comes to, to uh, chronic wounds and other infections in the body and also in, in animals, um, it is a little bit different. So first of all, what we see here, um, let me see my, my cursor, is of course a chronic wound. And if we uh, take a sample, a biopsy of some debrided material and perform microscopy on it, then we can find a lot of aggregates. Um, and our, all our previous work, we have focused on these aggregates. This is Pseudomonas aeruginosa in red. And you can see here in this uh, publication of 2008 that we really focused on the aggregates. But as you also can see, and with something we never really paid attention to, is all these single cells. But what you also can see is that it's not everything which is a biofilm. So just because you see a wound like this and it's yellow, doesn't necessitate that all this is biofilms. Um, and I'll come back to it. You cannot see um, the bacteria by the naked eye. Even large aggregates cannot be seen by the naked eye and cannot be visualized without um, 400 to 1,000 times magnification. We uh, performed a study which was led by uh, Matt Malone um, some years ago. <clears throat> and here, um, Matt uh, did this meta-analysis and looked through all the literature which showed um, direct microscopy of aggregated bacteria. And when summing up, he, um, we concluded that 80% of um, the wound pictures, they contain biofilms. So we've been discussing a lot that, yeah, I mean, you can say 100% of all wounds will contain biofilms. And we've been focused on that. And there's a lot of focus on biofilms, how to treat biofilms, also in Karen's talk, um, biofilm um, directed treatment and companies and researchers are working on, on um, diagnostics uh, for biofilm uh, identification. But as you saw in the earlier uh, picture, there's also a lot of single cells in the, um, in the wounds. And also there's a lot of biofilms um, in, in this. Um, the systematic review showed there's a lot of biofilms in acute wounds as well. Um, and also we have a study on uh, lung infections showing now that chronic lung infections like cystic fibrosis, the majority, at least over half of the biomass is situated in single cells, rest is biofilms, but also in acute infections, uh, community acquired pulmonary infections, there's a lot of aggregates. So, so this distinguishing between biofilms, aggregates and single cells might not be of that great of usage. When we look at uh, the chronic wounds by uh, microscopy, again, um, all the red in this, in A and B and C, and also here in yellow, in D, um, and the yellow in, in, um, in E and F, or the red in F, these are all bacteria. And you can see there's a lot of aggregates. Some of 
uh, on the surface, and, and some are also deeper in the moon. But again, as you can see, it's not the entire moon bed which is full of bacteria. It's situated in these small patches, and it's not that many bacteria uh, actually together. So if you have a colony on a plate, one colony of Staphylococcus aureus after overnight growth will contain 10 to the ninth bacteria. And, and we don't have that many here. So, so saying that even with critical colonization of uh, which we probably shouldn't use anymore, we should not use anymore, that 10 to the fifth bacteria is a critical colonization. You'll never be able to, to see such uh, small numbers. Also in these pictures, you can see we have all the um, aggregated bacteria, but, but also there's a huge amount of single cells, some being phagocytose, some lying outside of the cells. And these cells, they will be within the wound, bed. they will be in the same microenvironment. They are not the planktonic bacteria I showed in the animated movie before. So these will also be in slow growth. These cannot be eradicated by antibiotics. And most of all, they will not show up um, if you perform kind of biofilm uh, diagnostics. And actually, we do not know whether single cells are eradicated by um, antimicrobial treatment or not. We have some evidence from, from lung infections where we investigated um, sputum from CF patients before, during, and after um, antibiotic treatment. And here we can see it's not the biofilms, it's not the single cells with uh, um, um, as a whole, which are being eradicated. It's the fast growing bacteria which are being eradicated. The slow growing bacteria, also single cells, cannot be eradicated by antimicrobial uh, treatment. And all this probably comes down to the microenvironment. So this is a, a graph showing the microenvironment of a um, surface grown um, biofilm and vitro grown biofilm. We have bacteria growing on the surface. There are no hard surfaces in the wound. And here the bacteria themselves will create um, oxygen and nutrient gradients with high concentration outside and low concentration inside. So we have fast growth on the outside and no growth on the inside. If it's a, a, a flow cell system, um, you have continuous supply of nutrients and oxygen, but if it's a microtiter plate, you have static, um, you're not a new supply of oxygen and so on. So that also means you have different subpopulations in the in vitro biofilm. In the chronic wounds, it's not the same because here the bacteria are embedded within the wound bed. Um, you have some bacteria close to the surface, but the rest is actually within the wound. And these, um, and here it's the wound and the slough and all this, which create uh, the gradients. So most of the bacteria, if they're aggregates or not, will be um, exposed to very, very little oxygen. And most of them will be in, in slow growth. And the ones in a depth um, will not be, um, it's also difficult to, to diagnose. Um, what we think actually is the issue now, it's not whether bacteria are in biofilms or single cells or planktonic, it's the infectious microenvironment. It's the microenvironment of the infection. Um, so it's the surrounding of the bacteria. And here we have, of course, the bacteria in aggregate single cells, but also we have a lot of um, host cells. They can be resident cells like keratinocytes and, and the normal skin cells, but also we have phagocytes. And there's gonna be a lot of different uh, physical factors from um, which differ from, from the normal healthy skin. There's gonna be a lot of products produced by um, both the bacteria, but also inflammatory cells. And that's gonna be a change in substrate. And it's all this which actually leads to the um, poor healing, um, to uh, poor penetration of antibiotics, and also um, causing um, the wounds to, yeah, not to heal. But it's not the bacteria themselves, it's interaction, and it's also the underlying condition, which, um, which um, what do you call it, uh, sorry, which uh, prime for this infectious microenvironment to, to initiate. So if you're just a normal person, get a scratch or breeze in the skin, add bacteria, they'll be readily uh, eradicated. It's only if you have 
untreated uh, diabetes, edema, um, overweight, and all these things, then this um, changed microbiome in the same place, and you'll get bacteria which cannot be eradicated, and together with the host, it creates this vicious cycle of non healing. And we base it upon the tumor microenvironment, which has been very well characterized within the last 20 to 30 years. And here they have started to understand um, how, uh, how, how, what role the surrounding environment plays in the tumor. Um, and um, they can they do, now use the um, understanding of the tumor microenvironment um, to develop new treatments to understand cancer better and also um, for, for better diagnostics. And we believe we can do the same if we stop focusing on whether bacteria aggregate or not, but focus on actually understanding the wound, the wound bed, and especially the underlying conditions uh, of the patients. So for conclusion and facts, um, we need to understand much better where the bacteria are in the wounds. They are not just on the surface, they're also within the wound. And this is not something we stop for discussion, this is a, a fact. Also, we have to come to uh, um, the conclusion that in vitro observations cannot necessarily be directly extrapolated to in vivo and also vice versa. So if you work with the chronic wounds in, in a laboratory, you have to understand how the bacteria actually behave in the patients before you can start to manipulate with them um, in, in vitro and also in animal models. Um, and especially, and that goes also for all these new uh, diagnostic techniques, infecting bacteria are not necessarily visible uh, microscopically. Um, detection and identification methods are important, but, but they have to detect the right things and biofilms might not be the right thing. And, and it, it, we have to find new ways of actually um, looking into um, the uh, healing trajectory of wounds. And I think within the wound industry, there are too many claims and also in the literature without uh, clinical evidence. So clinicians and um, basic researchers like myself, we have to collaborate and understand each other much, much more. Um, and that goes for yeah, basic researchers like me, uh, the medical doctors, but also um, the treating uh, wound care nurses. So what is up for discussion? is again, of course, in vitro observation cannot be directly extrapolated. We know that matrix is not the same in vitro and in vivo. And also um, there's a very good question whether quorum sensing plays a role in the infections at all. It's not really been shown. It's been shown in vitro to, to be part of the in vitro biofilm formation, but there's no evidence and there's no support that quorum sensing should have a role in um, chronic wounds. And also, does the number of bacteria present in the wounds matter? Um, a lower threshold of critical transformation doesn't really mean anything because you can see from, from our um, uh, clinical observations that the aggregates differ in size, they're single cells, and you cannot um, just talk about critical colonization. And you have to understand um, at the microenvironment level what happens. And also, the species composition of the wound. I think it's very uh, individual from patient to patient. So that's not, um, it's not the same for all patients. So, so this has to be taken into consideration and we have to understand that much more. And again, too many claims without clinical evidence. And we have to understand the metabolism of the infecting bacteria, but also understand the metabolism of the residing um, inflammatory cells and, and host cells. And with that, um, yeah, uh, knowledge, my group here in Copenhagen and fantastic collaborators, and of course the Humor Foundation. And um, I think we are on a trajectory to something much better. We just have to understand and take a step back and understand what we do not know and what we do know. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas, for the excellent presentation again. And, and you showed very important points. And I guess your advice is also that we have to be critical yeah. on, on the research uh, that is available in the field and to uh, focus especially whether the findings are in vitro or in vivo, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. And of course, uh, I think we, we need also in vitro setups. We need 
course. Animal models. We just need to understand the, the shortcomings of the models. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, I think there is one question in the QA that goes to Karen in the end. Uh, but now we have another one. Uh, I noticed that copper dressings kill biofilm. Do you have experience with that? No. Okay. That's, that's a short answer. But, I don't. Yeah, that was clear. <laughs> okay. Does Karen or Edgar have. But normally, copper, I think, should be probably avoided um, in wounds. It's, uh, I think it's not the greatest ions to get in. So, um, yeah. Yes, thanks. Does Karen or Edgar have any comments or questions to Thomas? I, I don't have any experience with it either, but um, as a clinician, uh, but uh, I, I don't know of any uh, uh, studies, especially in the field that I work in, that uh, suggests that uh, it really works. But in theory, it, it will work because it's... Uh, it has antibacterial properties. Yeah. So I guess we need some more research. Then. Firstly, I think, and to Thomas, I think you've made some really good points about biofilm. From a nursing perspective, we talk about biofilms all the time. And people are still saying, that wound's got a biofilm because I can see it. Mm. When in fact, what they can see is fluff generally or just exudate. And there's a real dichotomy between the research such that people like you are doing and what happens in clinical practice and I think there needs to be more out there of what you're saying that look at the evidence review the evidence critically on what some people are saying will kill biofilm and understand that you can't just see it understand what a biofilm is yeah and I saw there was a question on pathogenic and non-pathogenic um I think that's a really good question because that's another thing I don't think we understand. Um, we uh, through the monitor to know, sir, and Staphylococcus aureus and E. fatalis and all these, they they can all excrete um, virulence factors. They can all cause infection and so on. But the exact role of each individual species in the wounds, um, we don't really know. We don't know if several um, Different species need to be together. We don't know the calling distance between bacteria and host cells and so on. Um, but we do know that normal staphylopidermidis can cause severe infections um, if they get dislocated, for example, from the skin. They can cause severe um, bone infections, uh, prosthetic joint infections, and can also cause infections um, in the wound. So, so I don't think you can... It's really difficult to distinguish between what is pathogenic and what is not pathogenic. What you can say, what you can look at as a clinician is probably if the wound is on a healing trajectory or not. And then I think you have to treat the patient, probably also um, the bacteria and so on, and make sure that you, if you can change the microenvironment by debridement and, and then keep the wound from being uh, um, yeah, Recontaminate and so on, but but again, I think a lot of that is. Um, I think maybe Edgar will, will also talk about that and the treatment because again, I'm I'm not a medical doctor. I'm just a scientist. So, um, but um, but I think if we can change the microenvironment, get the immune defense to maybe eradicate some of the bacteria and also get the healing started. I think that's um, and that wound can heal with also with bacteria. Okay, yeah. thank you, Thomas. And I think we move on at this stage. So I welcome Dr. Edgar Peters. He's an internist in infectious disease and also acute medicine specialist in Amsterdam. And his topic today will be a very clinical one, case with pressure ulcer and diabetic foot ulcer. Please, Edgar. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Kirsi. Um, so um, I have some uh, conflicts of interest, that is, I have some academic conflicts of interest. I've been a uh, member of several guideline group committees, and I've received some uh, research funding. 
I will be uh, discussing two cases. I will say that infection is a clinical diagnosis. You should apply proper culture techniques, only treat the pathogen. Uh, there's not much proof for topical antimicrobials. Don't overuse antibiotics and don't overuse antiseptics. Um, so I'll start off with a case. The first case is a uh, seven-year-old male with type two diabetes, which is had for 20 years. He's had a first and second ray amputation, as you can see on the uh, pictures here. He has neuropathy, no peripheral artery disease, and he wears his orthopedic shoe gear. And suddenly at a um, um, general consultation with the podiatrist, he had a blister on his forefoot. Now, um, what you see is a, a blister filled with fluid. Uh, it looks a bit sanguinolent. He has some callus there under his uh, fifth metatarsal head and some retinas surrounding the blister. Right. You can see it here, maybe here, and some, some whitish, well, things that shine through his uh, blister. Now, my question to you would be, what would you do? But uh, uh, since it's not an interest, interactive session, uh, just too many of you, I'll just do what I, I'll say what I did um, would it bright at the wound? I think that's the uh, first thing that you need to do if you see something like this, just to assess the wound severity and evolved tissue. In this case, it was just a superficial ulcer underneath. Um, so after we deroofed the blister, only the uh, subcutaneous tissue came out under it. Some uh, bleeding in the skin. We, of course, assessed his adherence to shoe gear. He was very religious at wearing his shoes, uh, but he just taken too many steps uh, the uh, the days before he sent it to hospital. Uh, we, we again assess his artery disease because that's really important in diabetic foot infections. And because we thought this was infected, we took a piece of uh, tissue from his wound bed and sent it in for culture. And we prescribed antibiotics because we thought that the, um, that there was at least some degree of infection in the foot. And what happened then, um, this is what the uh, blister initially looked like. This is what it looked like uh, after three days when we saw him back uh, uh, about a week ago. And this is what it looked like last week when uh, uh, about one week later, we when you see that the um, uh, clinical signs of inflammation have disappeared. So we stopped the antibiotic. And since then, he kept on improving. Now, the second case was a, a pressure ulcer of a patient that was hospitalized after he's been in his own bed for a couple of days, and he developed a pressure sore on his heel. He, uh, 72 years old, he had metastasized colon carcinoma and chronic kidney disease with a, um, a glomer glomerular filtration rate of about uh, 30 milliliters per minute. He has type 2 diabetes, and as far as we know, he did not have any peripheral artery disease. So again, we examined the wound and assessed severity, and we thought that it wasn't infected. So we debrided it and saw him back, back one week later, and this is what we saw, a superficial ulcer. At the time, we didn't think it was inflamed, so we did not um, take a sample for culture because we don't do anything with the culture results, and, and we did not prescribe antibiotics. And he, since then, he moved on to healing with the proper offloading and uh, wound protection. So show you this picture because things that I will be talking to you today are predominantly from the uh, uh, diabetic foot infection area and not so much from the pressure ulcer infection area because I know a bit more about diabetic foot infections. But I think most of the things that we see in both types of infections are uh, can be extrapolated to uh, the both of them and only in some details they might differ. So it's been said before, infection is a clinical diagnosis. Um, what's in, what, what you can do in, in diabetic foot infection is that you can grade the infection. Uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America and the International Working Group on the Diabetic Foot have made a, a foot infection classification ranging from grade one, no infection, as you can see here. Grade two would be two or more local signs or symptoms of inflammation, swelling, Retinas, pain, warmth, and pus, and no other explanation than infection, for instance, no gout or trauma. Infection grade three, a moderate, uh, moderately severe infection would be more erythema surrounding the wound or 
a deeper infection, an abscess, osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, or necrotizing fasciitis. An infection, uh, that's an example here that you just saw, an uh, osteomyelitis of a toe. An infection grade four would be any foot infection with uh, systemic inflammation, sepsis. And sepsis would be then defined as um, a SERS, or systemic inflammatory response syndrome, which consists of presence of two or more of the following, a fever or an under temperature, a tachycardia, tachypnea, and either leukocytosis or leukopenia. Now, why do we do this? Well, basically for three reasons. Two of them are that it, it will predict which patients need to be hospitalized and which patients will likely undergo an amputation, but also because it can guide our empiric antibiotic treatment. Now, sometimes I get a question by one of my colleagues or by somebody else or a student. So um, I've taken a swab from a wound and uh, it comes back with Staphylococcus aureus. So it's infected and I want to give uh, antimicrobial treatment. So what should I do? And I usually respond in this way saying that, well, uh, uh, when we're born, we're born as 100% human, but, but soon, uh, say after about two to three weeks, we're colonized with bacteria. So um, uh, when we are about one month old, we have about, say, a one-to-one -one, um, uh, ratio of bacteria and human cells. If you look at dry weight, um, so um, our guts and our skin and our wounds are uh, colonized with bacteria. And it doesn't mean that it's infected. Uh, if it's in the wrong place, it's infected. So it's in the wound bed and causing inflammation or if it's in your your bloodstream, it is an infection. But usually if you uh, culture a bacterium from a non-sterile um, uh, environment, it doesn't mean that it's an infection. Also, it depends, really depends on where you find that bacterium. This is a, um, a study from Northern France where they looked in patients that had suspected diabetic foot osteomyelitis to results from a percutaneously obtained bone biopsy compared to wound swabs, superficial swab from a wound. And they found that there was a concordance of only 22.5%. That means that if you target your antibiotic uh, uh, to a pathogen or a bacterium found in a wound swab, if you want to treat diabetic foot osteomyelitis, you have a 77.5% chance that you target the wrong organism. So it really depends on how you take the sample and how you interpret it. You look at therapy, um, uh, Casey has also uh, pointed out to you that uh, this is a very useful document. Uh, what basically it comes down to antimicrobial stewardship in wound care, as well as in uh, uh, pneumonia or any other infectious disease. So uh, prescribe antimicrobials if you don't need to give it for an infection, uh, give us a small spectrum uh, antibiotics as possible for a short period of time and in adequate dosing, switch from IV to oral if possible and treat in a multidisciplinary group, especially if it comes to complex infections like uh, wound infections. And, and why should we um, uh, withhold on prescribing antibiotics, especially if it's not needed? Well, because antibiotic usage, antibiotic prescription and consumption is associated with antimicrobial resistance. As you can see, these two maps are practically overlaying one another. So if a patient doesn't have an infection, for instance, uh, uh, COVID-19, we should withhold uh, prescribing antibiotic treatment, uh, but also in patients that have a non-infected wounds, it's not useful to prescribe antimicrobials. Uh, and that has been proven for diabetic foot ulcers, but also for venous leg ulcers. It doesn't speed up healing unless you have a clinical infection. Now, uh, it's not just antibiotics that we give to patients. We also uh, uh, prescribe copious amount of antiseptics. And the difference is that antiseptics are things that you can put on a wound, but you cannot take orally or intravenously. For instance, uh, um, uh, biguanide or uh, uh, iodine. Unless you are um, Donald Trump, who claimed that you could cure COVID-19 by injecting people with an antiseptic called Lysol. Surprisingly few studies have been um, um, uh, performed to topical antimicrobial treatment. 
Here, I'll just show you uh, the results of a systematic review to topical antibiotic treatment in diabetic foot infection. Only five RCTs were identified. And uh, this year, we also uh, published a systematic review to antiseptic uh, RCTs in diabetic foot infection. And we found only seven studies. I'll not get into them in detail. I'll just uh, give you a glance just to show you that we do not have a lot of data to support its use. That doesn't mean that it's not useful. It's just we don't have a lot of data to support its use. We need really need some more data. And it's not that it's completely harmless, not even antiseptics, because there's also links between uh, antiseptic use and antimicrobial and antibiotic resistance. And that has been proven for uh, chlorhexidine tolerance and cholestine and vancomycin resistance, and has even led to a ban of the Food and Drug Administration of America um, to um, antiseptic use in household soaps. Why? Because it doesn't prevent infection and it can lead to possible harm through antibacterial resistance. So which antibiotics should I prescribe then in, um, in, in, in wound infections? What's the silver bullet? Well, uh, if you'd like to, there's no silver bullet, unfortunately. I, uh, I have to disappoint you there. But if you want to prescribe empiric antibiotic treatment for diabetic foot infections, if you have a mild infection, so a grade two infection without any recent antibiotic treatment, so there's no uh, uh, selection of uh, antimicrobial resistance. And if you live in a temperate climate like Northwestern Europe or perhaps even Southern Europe, then you can get away with targeting just streptococci and staphylococcus aureus. But if you have a moderate to severe infection, if the stakes are higher, if you live in a tropical or subtropical climate, or if you've recently prescribed antibiotic treatment, or if there's ischemia, uh, you might want to cover gram-negative pathogens as well, and possibly obligate anaerobes, especially in case of ischemia. And then when the culture results come back from your, hopefully, tissue um, uh, biopsy, and then you can target your antimicrobial treatment to the uh, uh, sensitivity reports. Now, this is a slide that shows you that there is, in fact, a difference between high-income countries here in blue and low-income countries in, uh, in orange, uh, which basically comes down to uh, temperate environments and tropical environments. And what you can see that the um, uh, high-income countries tend to have more Staphylococcus streptococcus infections, and the uh, middle and low-income countries have more pseudomonas uh, and other gram negatives. And that probably has to do with the environment and the um, uh, amount of sweat, for instance, or the, um, uh, uh, well, basically the environment where you can find these bacteria. Do you always have to treat um, uh, Pseudomonas in diabetic foot infection? Is it always a pathogen? Uh, is it always present? Well, the coverage in temperate climates, again, is usually not necessary, but if you live in a tropical climate, or if you've previously isolated Pseudomonas, it's probably a good idea to cover them in your empirical treatment for moderate to severe infections as well, not in mild infections. Then can you tell by uh, the um, appearance of a wound if Pseudomonas is present? Well, there's been a, a very elegant study from uh, uh, Switzerland where they looked at the um, uh, ex uh, 13 experienced clinicians and made them decide if uh, Pseudomonas was present by just looking at the wound and smelling the wound and the reference standard was a culture. And they found that the specificity, uh, specificity was high, the sensitivity was low. That means that if that green discoloration is present, then it is suggestive that, uh, it's just that Pseudomonas is present, but not the other way around. If you don't see any green discoloration, that doesn't mean that there's no Pseudomonas present in diabetic foot infections. So how about decubital ulcers then? Well, again, you always should cover Staph aureus and Streptococci in case of uh, empirical antibiotic treatment. And the rest depends on the severity. If the stakes are high, go broader. So if you have a patient with uh, sepsis or really severe infection, then you go broader and then target down to whatever you find in the culture results. It depends on the anatomical location. If, you, uh, uh, if you're in the buttocks area, you expect more gram negatives and anaerobes, of course, and it depends on your geographical location because it changes the local resistance profiles. And again, you target to the culture and sensitivity results. Now, 
especially in Southern Europe, there's a lot of um, uh, multi-resistant organisms. Uh, I think you can use the uh, um, uh, more advanced um, uh, antibiotics that you can use for carbapenemase producing organisms. The problem is a bit that we don't have a lot of studies that uh, show that it's uh, that the outcomes are just as good as um, uh, uh, less complex antibiotics in uh, in in less uh, uh, resistant organisms. Uh, so there's a caveat to the use of those advanced antibiotics. But you know, if you need to use it because of presence of uh, resistance, then you have to use it, of course. Um, so how long should you treat? Well, if you have a mild infection, treat for one to two weeks. If you have a moderate to severe infection, treat for a bit longer, say two, three, maybe even four weeks. If you have bone and joint infection, if you resect all the bone, uh, for instance, if you do a uh, 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 below the knee amputation in case of a foot infection, they only need to treat for two, maybe three days. If you debride the uh, bone completely and you have residual soft tissue left, treat for one to two weeks, just like you would treat a, uh, say, a moderate infection. If you still have positive bone margins after bone resection, treat for three weeks. There's one a Swiss study that suggests that that's non inferior to six weeks. And if you do not perform surgery, if you have dead bone in C2, then you have to treat for six weeks. And that's what I, what does it say? So my uh, goals and take-home messages, I discussed two cases. Infection is a clinical diagnosis. Apply the proper culture techniques. I suggest you take a wound bed biopsy or a bone biopsy if you have the opportunity. I would not rely too much on uh, swabs. And if you do, if you do use a swab, then... I would apply the Levine technique. It's been discussed earlier. Only treat the pathogen, so treat what you find in the uh, culture results. There's not much proof for topical antimicrobial, although we use it a lot, especially topical antiseptics, but don't overuse antibiotics and also don't overuse antiseptics. Well, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Edgar. Again, an excellent presentation. And I like very much the, the clinical view of your presentation, and especially the Pseudomonas trial. <laughs> that was nice. Yeah, like I <laughs> uh, there are some questions. Um, the first one, in the blister case, why you remove the skin and not just empty the blister? And in that case, the liquid, liquid of the blister should be able to culture and in case it looks purulent, for example. Yeah, if there's pus that you can aspire from a uh, blister or from an abscess, that's also very useful information. I, I completely agree with that. Um, uh, there was a lot of tension under the uh, blister, so when, when it was inside it, it practically burst open and uh, all the fluid was gone. Um, it wasn't purulent, but it was sangulent, so it, it might not have given us the... Um, um, uh, data that we need, but I would agree that you can uh, uh, hand in the pus that will give you adequate um, uh, data that you can work with for your resistance problem. We removed the whole blister um, uh, roof because uh, that was really the only way that we could probably assess, properly assess the uh, the wound bed. Thank you, and I think this is a question for Edgar, but for Thomas as well. So Thomas, uh, if Edgar first answers and Thomas can comment, do you think that biofilms specifically can contribute to chronic wound pain as infection is known to do that? Well, um, so a, a low grade infection can lead to pain as well. Um, uh, but, you know, if, if, if suppose there's some redness and some pain, you would already uh, qualify for, you know, to have a clinical infection. And um, uh, so it might not be the biofilm per se, but the associated inflammation that can lead to uh, pain. But that's um, in my opinion. I don't know how Thomas feels about that. Basically, I don't think it's a bacteria causing the pain. It's probably host defense and uh, inflammatory reaction um, going on. Uh, of course, there can be some virulence factors, but uh, usually they're not really going systemic and so on. So I think it's more the 
the inflammatory process, which causes the pain and so on. And and as it has nothing to do with with biofilms, maybe the bacteria, but then not the biofilms. Thank you. And then there is a comment uh, lately. It was in the news in Holland that there is a lot of antibiotics in the water, sewers, due to dumping of medicine. Is there a real consequence for us in the near future? I'm sure there is, but could uh, first Edgar and then Thomas comment about specific data for this one? Yeah, that, that had to do with um, with the uh, um, uh, discarding of, uh, of antibiotics that were yeah. not uh, swallowed and used, but uh, also with the excretion of antibiotics by, uh, you know, uh, urinating uh, while you're in antibiotics. Uh, I don't think it matters much because the, um, uh, not, not clinically at least, because the, um, um, the concentrations of those antibiotics are really low. Uh, but yeah, it, it can lead to more uh, antimicrobial resistance in the environment, of course, it can. Uh, and it costs more money to get those uh, the traces of antibiotics out of the uh, sewage system by uh, decontamination. So yeah, it, it has some consequences, but not specifically for our patients, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to really add on to that. Thanks. Uh, then we have some time for discussion. Uh, and I think the first one goes to Karen. Uh, in case of biopsy, do you recommend mapping the wound or how to select the area to take the sample? So yes, we always map a wound prior to doing anything. So look at where it is, how deep it is, what sort of, um, is it contaminated? Is it infected? Is there a lot of exudate? There may also be times when people may want to do an ultrasound or even an MR scan or something dependent on where the wound is and the patient's comorbidities. And again, it just depends where the wound is and what the patient's like. So look at the patient holistically. Right, thank you, Karen. And then there is a question both for Thomas and I think Edgar could answer this one also, but first Thomas, can you comment on the link with biofilm and antimicrobial resistance? Well, I, I think it's uh, most important. It's uh, probably a link of the bacterial metabolism, uh, how fast or how slow the bacteria are growing if they actually respond to antibiotics and also whether the antibiotics um, can get into the wound. Systemic antibiotics, can they get from the blood into the wound and also topical antimicrobial agents and antibiotics? Can they really penetrate into the wound? So again here, I think if, even though I'm a professor in biofilms, I think we, we have to stop talking about the biofilms. It's more the bacteria and understanding the bacterial metabolism and also understanding the microenvironment of the wound and how can we actually interfere with that. Thanks. Do you have further comments, Edgar? Uh, well, we do know from other infections, uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, foreign body associated material, uh, foreign body material associated infections, uh, infected uh, prosthetic joints, etc., that um, uh, antibiotics are um, not just in vitro, not very helpful in, in killing the bacteria, but also not in vivo. Um, you need longer antibiotics. You need surgery to to debride the um, uh, to the bright, the pus and the uh, exudate, etc. Uh, so uh, you can't just depend on antibiotics and probably not antiseptics if you want to get rid of all the bacteria. You need to remove them mechanically as well or get them out of that um, uh, biofilm. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Sharp debridement. Very Sharp debridement in, in, in wounds is, is therefore necessary because you, you can't kill them all with just um, antiseptics and antibiotics. Thanks. And there, there is a comment about copper dressings uh, that uh, Catherine is writing that uh, they have not been able to get FDA or 
European license as not enough evidence. Well, I think that is the case with many dressings. And this one goes to Karen. What do you think about Manuka honey dressings? They've got a place, definitely, Kirsty. And again, I go back to looking at the patient, looking at the wound and debating what sort of wound dressing you do need on there. And again, what you can get hold of as well. And that's really important because when we look at low middle income countries, they're not as lucky that they don't have an, as much choice as we do. But also to be careful that you're not adding more moisture into a wound. You don't want it very wet. You don't want to damage that peri wound area either. So choose your dressing dependent on the full assessment. Not one dressing works for everybody. Exactly. And, and there is a comment also that uh, I believe to treat whole patient on the whole in the patient, as you Karen, very nicely described. And, and, and there is a comment, well, I think we can close this conversation now, but now there's a comment that the copper dressings have a license, but okay, that's good information. And, and then we have a comment that I have seen in several patients that the use of diapers as secondary dressing when there is a lot of exudate and always appears blue green colored exudated. I always think in pseudomonas, but maybe something in the diaper material. Have you seen that also happen with gauze dressings? Uh, that and they don't have odor. So the question is about uh, using diapers as secondary dressings. I could comment this one firstly that yes, in Finland also we see cases that diapers and are used and it depends on the material on the diapers, but uh, of course they are not the optimal ones. And well, about the color, uh, I cannot I do. I cannot answer that. Does any one of you have other experience or comments on the diaper material? We wouldn't use diapers as a secondary dressing, Kirsty. So, yeah. No, but I think you're exactly. right. There could be something in there because it seems unusual that every single patient has pseudomonas that mm. you put a diaper over. Yeah, I agree. There yeah. might be some chemical reaction in the diaper, some a chemical composite in the diaper that does it as well. I could tell. Exactly. Yeah. And there is a question, is the time acronome still the best assessment tool for wounds? And this one, I think I will give first to Karen again. You're too kind. Um, and <laughs> yeah. Time is really useful. It helps people focus. You've got your tissue, infection, moisture, epithelialization as well. We've also had some changes to the time as we've got times with the S on for social and timers. But I think using some sort of wound assessment tool like your time helps people focus and methodically look at the wound. So yes, time's absolutely fine. Yes, I totally agree, but I could also highlight that you have first you have to have the right diagnostics and the assessment about but for the wound bed yeah perfect but but always we come again to this point that look at the uh, whole patient not just the hole in the patient mm -hmm. yeah very important and, and then uh, uh, there is uh, a question, would anyone like comment on the concept of the role of antibiotics in disturbing the bacterial composition or community in the wound? The role of antibiotics. Meanwhile, you are thinking, well, we know that if the patient gets uh, cyprofloxacin, the pseudomonas comes very soon resistant to that one so if you use it in a colonized wound do not that that's a dermatological opinion and comes into my mind but please be free to comment otherwise that's that, that's one thing i think so you, you you get development of antimicrobial resistance but also you get selection so if you for instance in your case uh, give pseudomonas to uh, that pseudo uh, uh, give cyprofloxacin to that pseudomonas the uh, bacteria that will be sensitive to cyprofloxacin will be replaced by 
maybe Staph aureus that's quinolone resistant that might be even more pathogenic. Who knows? Or it might be replaced by uh, uh, some other uh, uh, Klebsiella species that might be more invasive. So yes, it 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 can lead to more problems in the long run um, because you you can't treat the new bacteria with the cyclofloxacin that you've already used. Um, the bacteria that are now present in the wound and might cause infection have been replaced by cyclofloxacin resistant organisms. Yeah. Exactly. So again, uh, only antibiotics when you have uh, real infection, systemic infection. But mm -hmm. I know from clinical practice, it is very usual that when a physician comes, a physician that is not so expert in wounds, he says bacterial swab and cephalosporin. And that is not the right thing. You should assess and look at the whole. And, and usually venous leg ulcers, for instance, they have a lot of exudation, although, but still they are not infected in such way that you should use antibiotics. And, and the same is probably true for antiseptics as well. For instance, if you have that pseudomonas in your venous leg ulcer and apply um, uh, acetic acid, then you, you create a more uh, a favorable environment for bacteria that like acetic acid. And you might need to switch to, say, a bigranide or iodine or, or some other uh, antiseptic so to, to change it constantly to, to make sure that those bacteria will have to be uh, on the tips of their feet all the time and to change. But if you if you apply one type of antiseptic, one type of antibiotic, yeah, it, it'll lead to uh, uh, problems with antimicrobial resistance in the uh, longer run. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, another question uh, about a best practice article on dressing times for different kinds of wounds. Can you recommend an article? Well, again, I will look to Karen because I know you are expert in this field. But um, I think, it, yeah. yeah. And it's an interesting question. And sadly, there won't ever be a best practice document on it because, again, you've got exactly what Kirsty's been saying and Kathleen said, you're treating the whole of the patient. So addressing won't heal a wound it's everything else that goes with it it's the diagnostics it's the wound bed assessment it's the comorbidities and it's what type of wound do you have as well so you need to assess all of that and then choose your dressing so you can't say that if you've got an infected leg ulcer you will use dressing a if you've got a pressure ulcer you'll use dressing b for example it all depends on that full assessment of the patient and I also think what's come out of this webinar as well is the importance of a multidisciplinary approach to managing all different types of wounds. So listening to what the scientists say and then putting that into practice for the clinicians as well. And Thomas very clearly mentioned that we can do lots of things within the laboratory, but that doesn't always um, show exactly what's going on in clinical practice. So working together will help us then decide how to manage that wound. And the dressing is the last thing that you decide on. Thank you, Karen. This is like honey for my eyes, <laughs> <laughs> but my ears, sorry, because I, I totally agree. And here I could make a teaser on our lower leg also diagnostics document as well, because uh, I totally believe that if we if we make proper diagnostics and assessment, we can r reduce antibiotic use. And in fact, this has been proven in Sweden when they started the use of the wound register, uh, the antibiotic use was reduced by 30%. So that we, we treat uh, the, the exact cause of the wound and we are more confident in that and, and not just using antibiotics. And Kathleen comments that, thank you, Karen, said very well. <laughs> okay, I think we have had a lot of positive feedback in the chat. I really enjoyed all the presentations. I think we, we had a, a great discussion and, and we are all working in the same direction better treatment for our patients and, and also for the antimicrobial stewardship. 
clearly there is uh, research we have to do in the future, but I think we are in the right direction. And please, Karen, you, you can say also some final concluding words. Um, I think listening to what we've all been saying and talking about biofilms, how to manage a range of different wound types, and also the aids that we have for this, the antimicrobial stewardship is everybody's responsibility to understand very clearly. Edgar and Thomas have talked about using the correct antiseptics, correct antibiotics, but in a judicious manner as well. It's interesting as well that the World Health Organization very clearly spoke about antibiotics that are given to animals and to fish. So we have to look at that as well, that that's getting into seas, like the person said from the Netherlands as well. So it's not just about us looking at the patients, but looking at the whole ecosystem as well. And as well to remember just from what the last question was that your wound dressing is the last thing to think about. Please do look at the patient as a whole, look at the diagnostics, treat the cause of the wound, and then think about how can I help to promote the healing trajectory using wound dressings. But it's for us to all work together. It's not just one person's role, it's everybody's. And to talk to the scientists as well, Cursor, to find out what's going on in the labs. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And now I will give the words to Thomas, some final comments, conclusions. Well, I just thank you everyone for listening and um, let's continue the great debate and explore what actually causes wounds not to heal. And um, yeah, so, so thanks. Thank you for being here. And Edgar. Well, thank you. For the uh, invitation to uh, to be present on this uh, webinar, I really enjoyed myself, and I uh, I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks from Yuma's side, and the webinar is recorded indeed, so you will find it from Yuma website in a couple of days. Amalia, would you like to comment something I have forgotten? Uh, it will bo both be available on the website, and I will also send you all a link uh, to the recording. Yeah. Great. 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 See okay. you all. See you all. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye.